Welcome back to Special Ed on Special Ed. I am your host, Dana Johnson. And today I'm really excited because our guest is Diana Nadeo, who is a licensed clinical psychologist, and she's going to talk to us about evaluations. But I can't do anything without my disclaimer, so let's hear that first. The information in this podcast is provided for general informational and entertainment purposes only and may not reflect the current law in your jurisdiction at the time you're listening. Nothing in this episode creates an attorney-client relationship, nor is it legal advice. Do not act or refrain from acting on the basis of any information included in or accessible through this episode without seeking appropriate legal or other professional advice on the particular facts and circumstances at issue from a lawyer or service provider licensed in your state, country, or other appropriate licensing jurisdiction. Before we get started, though, I want to give you a little background on Diana. Dr. Nadeo is a licensed clinical psychologist. She's also the owner of the Center for Assessment and Psychotherapy in Newtown, Connecticut, which is a private practice focusing on work with children, adolescents, and young adults. She's dedicated to seeing the whole child and specializes in pediatric psychological assessments that focus on emotions, personality, learning, and behavior. Dr. Nadeo is also well-versed in psychiatric diagnosis, educational assessments, and a wide range of treatment approaches, using this information to create a useful and effective plan for patients and their families. She also values the relationships between herself and her patients and strives to create a warm, accepting, and easygoing atmosphere while also emphasizing the need to undo old patterns of behavior that are barriers to healthy functioning. Dr. Nadeo is also an assistant professor in the Education and Educational Psychology Department at Western Connecticut State University, where she instructs and trains graduate students entering the field of clinical mental health counseling and school counseling. That is a lot. Hi, Diana. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Yes, I've had the great fortune of having you in some of my IEP meetings because you do a lot of evaluations for schools as well as for parents and give great educational recommendations. I particularly like your PowerPoints. Dr. Nadeo does a PowerPoint presentation after her her evaluations for a lot of students for school districts, and I think it makes it really accessible and understandable. I like the visuals. I, I just like how you present them. I think you have an understanding of how much we don't understand, if that's the right way to put it. <laughs> yeah, well, there's no, there's no point in writing 15 pages of jargon. Isn't helpful for anyone, but there is a standard, right? That a report be written in that way. It doesn't mean we have to communicate the results in that way. So even I will pick up a report sometimes and have to sit there with the dictionary, right? To decipher, decode what is actually being said. So I think that's like the, what I hope to bring to the table here today and, and also in the meetings yes. for all of us to get it, right? Like we need to, understand it. It's not about... And I mean, I find I've been reading these reports for years and I still find myself pulling out my like whisk book or like whatever it yeah. is to be like, how does this work again? Or what does that mean again? So I find it really helpful. And I love the way you connect the results to the child as to how they are and what they need and why. So it's not just here are my numbers and here's what the child needs and do it. There's like mm-hmm. a whole explanation behind it. So I find that really helpful. And the reason I wanted to have you on here today was because I also had the privilege of seeing you present not that long ago on evaluations and explaining them and understanding why they're necessary and why people like you do exactly what you do and why it is so important. So I do want to start with why does one need an evaluation? You're, you don't work for school districts. School districts are obligated to provide an evaluation. So what is it? Why would a parent be coming or a school district be calling you and saying, we need you to evaluate this kid? What is different between you and the school psychologist or whoever they have on staff? So I think there's a few things that really set uh, kind of an outside evaluation apart from a school type of evaluation. And the main one that stands out is the, the breadth of testing that can be done in a private setting, right? So I know that the schools are coming from a place of, you know, needing to meet a lot of needs and not always having the resources to spend hours and hours doing testing. Therefore, it's like appropriate, although not always done, right, in this way, uh, to refer out when we need to dive deeper and we need to dig a little bit more to figure out what is going on, what is the problem area, because what we're doing now isn't working. So I try to approach testing, whether it's a family wanting a second opinion 
because the school testing wasn't sufficient or they don't agree with it, or it's the school and the, usually it's the school and the family, right? In the form of a independent eval coming together and needing a third person to mediate perhaps some like kind of discrepancies or conflict between the school and the family. Either scenario, my job and how I view testing is to really tell the story of the child. And I don't want just the table of contents, mm -hmm. which is often what um, kind of more kind of straightforward testing and school testing entails. I want to tell the story of at least three to four chapters. We can't, <laughs> and I, I would about 15 pages would turn into, you know, 45 and, and it can be done, but it really, to what degree is it helpful to know every single thing about the child when you can only start with what's most disruptive, what's most of an interference. So my approach is to get as much information as I can in a reasonable, that's, that's reasonable and, and timely and really hone in on those three key features of the child's functioning, whether that includes how they respond to difficult emotions, what they do when they can't read something or understand it, or why, why can't they do math facts quickly, right? We want to unpack that because things aren't unidimensional. Everything is multiply determined. And so by that, I mean, what's the recipe? What are the ingredients in the recipe that make up this problem area? I love that. The other piece I wanted to ask you specifically was when we, when the school district does an evaluation, they refer to it as a psychoeducational. And that means the cognitive component as well as the educational component. And that often includes an achievement component, meaning, you know, what can they do and what do they know? Do you do neuropsychological evaluations or are they also psycho eds? Does that make sense? Yep. I do. So I'd say a straightforward neuropsychological evaluation is I think the word is used more loosely than intended to describe testing of different kind of capacities. So it's a good question. Formal neuropsych testing usually implies that there's some medical condition that has caused a disruption in organic brain functioning. So if I have a child who got into an accident, a car accident, and suffered from a traumatic brain injury as a result of that accident, a neuropsychological assessment in this way would be really helpful because it includes things like brain scans, MRIs, to look at the brain and really see what may have been altered and then to test to see if there's accuracy between like the frontal lobe being harmed in some way. And we know that when the frontal lobe is disrupted, we can have things like a uh, lack of inhibition or um, problems self-regulating in general. We also know that kids present right with all sorts of issues that can look like, you know, right? Our brain is responsible for regulating and modulating all the different experiences we have. So while neuropsych tests are super important to include in a battery of assessments, I don't, I think, I think that formal neuropsychological testing, uh, has a time and place. Instead, so to answer your question, I would, most of my assessments include psychoeducational and neuropsychological all in one. I tend to view them more as comprehensive evaluations, I guess, taking which, you know, that include neurocognitive, academic, social, emotional, and personality. We need to have those four features there. And what you call it, I guess, fits into both categories. And that's because I think that the unfortunate kind of trend is that neuropsychological testing is what it's called, right? So people are out in the world asking for that, but it's not always necessarily necessarily what they need. Yes. And I have clients who will say, oh, I'm getting a neuropsych. Insurance is paying for it. And I know that that's even more different because insurance can't pay for educational component, correct? Right. So insurance companies specifically state in all of their guidelines that any form of psychological or neuropsychological testing it is a covered service if it's done for medical necessity. And it's something I'm very sensitive to and cautious in terms of testing the limits in any capacity, because the second we bring in education, academics, the parents technically could be at risk of getting a very big bill at the end of the day. Got and 
That's because it's up to the insurance companies to dictate what is, quote, too educational. Right. You know, for myself, <laughs> I'm not trustworthy of the insurance customer service rep who's authorizing. They're doing their job. They have a protocol to follow. They in no way, shape or form have a expertise that allows them to dictate these rules uh, yeah. on a kind of clinical level, but they do on an administrative level. About when kids are, this is just a random question that popped in my head, but what about children who are, they're not children anymore, like adults? Like I know some people when they maybe go to graduate school or something need to get evaluated or want to get evaluated to see, but they're no longer under the purview of their education system. Mm-hmm. Would that change at all the outcome of a neuropsych for that person or no? In terms of the coverage or in terms of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Group- no, it's, it's, it's educational purposes. So it cannot, um, unless I can just, so the way I think about it and why it's such a ridiculous kind of concept is that even at like the college level or graduate school level, rather, I want to see if I have a learning disability that will make schoolwork more stressful for me and therefore make, might make me vulnerable to develop an anxiety disorder. So in a preventative model of healthcare, we would test at the uh, beginning stage of starting this new endeavor so we can limit the possibility or reduce the likelihood that I could develop some mental health issues mm-hmm. by putting a plan in place ahead of time. But we live in a very reactive system. Yeah. And it, so it waits for the house to catch on fire, doesn't put the stovetop fire out first. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I know that, I know that a lot of parents hit that area when children are going to college or even graduate school or something along those lines and need that information. And they're not cheap evaluations. I'm very, (laughs) I mean, I can talk a little bit about the public school's obligations. And I think we know that schools are obligated to evaluate children when they're referred for special education, that they are obligated to evaluate them every three years if they are qualified for special education. And I think you typically come in, as you said, when either the child is so complicated that both the parents and the school district are looking for something a little deeper, or perhaps the parents have asked for an independent, or sometimes the school asks for an independent. Mm -hmm. I've had that happen as well. Understanding that your type of evaluation, I don't mean you just specifically, but outside evaluators really can dig in a little deeper. They can assess more of the process than the school can, correct? That's a great term to... Views. Yes, right. Yeah. Not getting just like not focusing on the content. So the content would be the test scores. Exactly. And right. the process is what does that mean in relation to the child's life? Right. Exactly. How did they come to those test scores and how should we be looking at them and are they valid or not? So I think that's that's important information for parents to have. What are and and I don't know if you covered this a little bit. I did say about the um, cognitive and achievement, but what are the different tests that you would incorporate into that neuropsych or psychoed that you would do as a private evaluator? Do you have more tools than like the public school would have or different tools? Uh, I think, yeah, I think that you get more creative and have to look into what else is out there to be able to still meet the needs of the role of being an outside evaluator because the kids likely had the standard battery that we all use when we someone comes into my office and they're simply just wanting to get testing done. Not simply, but you know, right? it's not for the purpose of the school. Maybe they want to understand the school and academic functioning, but it's not in a relationship to an IEP or eligibility for special ed. And in that, pull up the toolbox that contains like the basics, the basics that you need uh, in the cognitive, academic, and social, emotional realm. For a child who's had an IEE where or who's having an evaluation done where the school has done testing in the near Past, the distant past, um, that uh, they are likely to have had that initial set of the standard types of assessments. So, yeah, I think that for the cognitive, right, I'll go kind of maybe I'm going to go through each one and in my mind tell you what, what the standard is and what they likely had and then what I might use in response or in, re- in replacement for that. Uh, just a, as a side note, to just familiarize everyone, you can repeat. Uh, especially cognitive and academic achievement tests are very sensitive to the practice effect so that when a child is given any assessment of things like working memory, processing speed, reading abilities, math calculation skills, when they've already done it once, they're likely to do better the second time you give it, not because they've... 
protocols, right? right? It's the right. exact same test. If I give them, the right. if I would, if, yes, there are the tests, but if I were to just repeat the, you know, the WISC, for example, so the cognitive component or cognitive and intellectual functioning is usually measured by the, for kids, the WISC, which is the Wexler Intelligence Scale for children. And then once they hit 16, it's the uh, Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. So the Wexler system is the most kind of um, popular, uh, kind of, highly uh, large norm group, standardized over decades and uh, constantly kind of evolving and updating in its additions to be up with the, to get up to date with the times and findings of in the literature on the field. So that would be the standard. And if someone were to have done that, a child was, did that at school level for their testing in September, if I repeated it even four to six months later, which I think we, in our minds feels like a large gap of time, I am vulnerable to the child presenting as they're, though they're functioning better than they are because they might do better on each of those tests simply by nature of the fact that they've seen the stuff before. That doesn't mean they remember. Oh, I, I, I mean, part of it is, yes, just a memory thing. I remember that question and the answer, but they're not given feedback. So that's usually what people think, but it's not. It's the anxiety and the level of unknown that is what is kind of one of the foundational components of why this testing is effective. I'm trying to grasp the snapshot. I'm trying to get a snapshot of you at this point in time um, without any studying or without any preparation. So un the unknown component is really important. And that is why when we give it again, the familiarity and the greater or just even a little bit of comfort with it will ca could cause someone to do better as a result. I might replace that with um, like the, the Rias, the Reynolds intellectual Reynolds. To clarify with the IEE, because you know I think that term is thrown around sometimes, an independent educational evaluation is technically any evaluation not done by the school district. But I think we're using it in the in the term of, and a lot of times in Connecticut, or at least I refer to IEE as an evaluation that the parent has requested after the school district does their own evaluation. So there's a component in the IDEA, which is a law that governs special education, that says that once the school district does their evaluations, then the parent, if they disagree with them, if that evaluation doesn't look like your child, or if it looks like them, but maybe not the same highs and lows, you know, if, if there's anything about it that you disagree with, then you can disagree and request an independent educational evaluation. And if your school district agrees with you, then you pick the evaluator and they pay for it. They, they're obligated to give you a list of evaluators, but you don't have to use their evaluators. I personally always find if you can come to a mutually agreed upon person, I always find it a little easier than to get those recommendations implemented. So I find that to be a good strategy but it doesn't have to be. And you still have the right to get it and the school district is still obligated to consider it. But technically independent evaluations are anyone not in the school district and the school can ask for one, but that doesn't meet the parents' IEE rights if the school district asks for it because if they choose the evaluator and they ask for it, then it's still their evaluation. So I just wanted to clarify that. You were saying about the the rights. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to say is that a lot of times what I'll hear from school districts is they're just going to use the same tests we did. And my response is typically, well, outside evaluators tend to have access to a variety of different tests. And I do know that some tests have alternate sheets, like a, a type A or a, or a part A or part B. So they some tests can be done the exact same test. It's just a different protocol. So they're not actually doing the same work, right? Yep, 100%. Right, so it's a different form, different items, just the same test developer. It's under the same name. So you just, you know, you want to find an evaluator who has a complementary version, an alternative version of an alternate version of the test that was done by the school. So the, the RIAS to the Reynolds in intellectual assessment scales do mirror a lot of the tests that are on the WISC. There's the Stanford Binet, uh, amongst others that are available out there. What, as it relates to academics, Woodcock Johnson or the, the Wexler, and there's that name again, achievement tests are often used. So I will use one of the two that the school didn't. And then really, though, I, I think that the, there's at least two uh, broad 
main kind of attractions, standouts rather, uh, within each category. And then from there, I try to replicate, right, do the one that wasn't done, but then hone in on what do we need to know more about? Because if this kid's doing really well verbally, yes, I want to repeat the verbal comprehension test of the broad measure, but I don't need to spend more time doing another battery telling me how, if it's, cons- if it's consistent, right? If the scores are high average, high average. I need to focus on these other features that might be consistently low average or the problem area or the kind of sticking point usually. The child is just on the cusp of average. So the school testing, they're just at that 25th percentile. Um, so as a side note, when we say av- the term average, my opinion, means nothing. The term <laughs> high average does and the term low average does. And I'll, I'll explain why. Average represents kids who are in the 25th percentile all the way to the 75th percentile. And so percentiles are basically, like, I did really as well. Really broad average. range. <laughs> yeah. Um, so and a percentile is not like a test score, like 75% is like a C. No, it's percentiles are um, the degree to which you've done as well or better than the other people in your age group on that particular test or construct. So if I have someone reading at the 25th percentile, that's right at the cusp of average and low average, which is very different than someone who's reading at the 74th percentile, which is on the cusp of high average or 75th percentile, high average and average. And so therefore, um, that, though that would be an area I'd want to dig into a little bit more. So it's not that the strength is not of importance, but once I've maintained um, uh, established consistency, it's time to move on to kind of other other mechanisms. So I tend to try and find subtests, right, from different batteries that can be useful to kind of um, meet that need. And that was actually, that that leads right into my next question, which was going to be, how do we understand these test scores? And I do know that that's hard to explain without visuals. Yep. I, I'm a visual person, so I, I love that, that, that curve, the bell. But can you articulate, you know, how do parents interpret these? Because sometimes, like you said, they'll say, well, they're in the average range. And I'm looking at it. And I'm like, they're in the average range at the 26th percentile. That's completely different, as you just said, as the 75th percentile average range. I've also noticed sometimes schools don't offer all of the different numbers. So like there's a standard scale, there's a percentile, and then sometimes there's a grade of equivalency. And I've even seen within the school district, you'll get one year, you'll get one of those, and the next year you'll get a different one of those. And so what can parents do to better understand these scores once they actually see them other than hearing, well, they're average? Mm -hmm. So there will always be tables, there should be, in the back of a testing report that lists all the scores and the scales. I would start there. If you don't have a table of all the scores, right. make that request. Call the evaluator, yes. Exactly. Um, for school testing, um, not always for medical, but for school testing, that's uh, a necessity. So why that stands out here is that the tables are going to contain all the scores that make up any one, like, um, like we have an umbrella term, or an, an umbrella co- construct we're measuring. Uh, processing speed, anxiety, attention, right? So that's just the umbrella term. I'm going to get a score from the umbrella that's an average. It's an average of a bunch of different tests that were done that are like, this is what you are overall in your attentional capacity, how much you can, how long you can maintain attention, we'll just say. It doesn't take into account what that doesn't tell you, because we know right within any average lower scores are going to offset higher scores. Um, And so when you're looking at a classroom average, how well does this entire class know the material from the test? Right, we can take into account the variability for all the different students and what they're bringing to the table. Here, we only have one. We have one child. We need to know. So in in the case of the average for the classroom on the test scores, we just want to make sure that most people, right, are falling into a certain range and what the combination of scores are. Here, we're going to assume that the overall score is representative of all those little test scores just for the child, that one child. So you need to go back to the tables and look at the, the subscales. Look at what's called the scaled score, not so much the standard score. The standard score is the umbrella. The scaled score or the The scaled scores are what make up all the sub areas that resulted in the average umbrella term. 
I was like, what umbrella is for? Yeah, because I think sometimes within those subsets, there'll be, you know, like a huge discrepancy, sometimes between the umbrella scores too, you know, from one area to another, there might be a huge discrepancy. And there was a time that we required that to find a learning disability, which we no longer require just that, but it is still an indicator of a learning disability. Absolutely. Huge differences across the board, because I guess technically someone should be somewhat consistent, right? That right. if I average area you should be in another yep so that's why so you're looking at the subscale scores first to see are these clustering together or are they separate so if you have a child whose subscale scores whose who's, who's umbrella score the overall score is in the 50th percentile and then all the five things that make up that average are between the 40th percentile and the 60th yeah, they're kind of they're in the same range that they're co-mingling together. If you think of it on a graph, like data points, right? They're all kind of in the same area. When you have a scaled score or one of those things under the umbrella is very high and another is very low or a few are really high and two things are really low, we have what's called a scatter. And scattered scores automatically represent some type of problem area because we really should cluster together with the things we're better at being a little bit higher than the things we're not so good at, but they should generally be in the same range. Yeah. So that then gives an indication when there is the scatter, something is going on. One point's high on the graph, one point's low, something is interfering to make that line a diagonal and not linear. I love the visual too. If you look at when sometimes they talk about just full scale, like full scale, they're average here. And I think, you know, you could have a full scale of 110 here and a full scale of 110 here. But if you graphed out those specific points underneath, those two children may not look at all anything. Right. Like yeah. they may not at all be the same just yeah. because that one large overarching score that is similar. So it does drive me nuts when I hear that. But overall, they're like, hi, right. <laughs> Like, no, that's not that's not how this works. Like yep. we gotta look at everything individually and break it up. Yep. And so then second to your point, then next you want to look at all of the umbrella t- scores that are out there. So that then leads to what is now considered a dated model, but one I use as part of my decision making, um, the discrepancy or the difference between the umbrella scores for cognitive and intellectual functioning and those for academic achievement. So we expect our cognitive abilities, working memory, processing, uh, nonverbal reasoning, uh, verbal comprehension, vocabulary level, all of those things are the skills that underpin learning in subject areas we teach our children in the public school system, reading, writing, and math, essentially. So because we need solid vocabulary, uh, like we would need a strong score on the vocabulary test, the cognitive assessments to predict reading level, right? We would see those two things as being as being interrelated, right? Because we know that when you have a stronger command over your vocabulary, reading is easier, right? And so that makes someone want to read more, which increases their vocabulary. It's a nice kind of cycle that um, facilitates that that skill set. So therefore, the test scores will look very similar between those two. We want to see them be linear, where that meet by that, because I know we don't have a visual representation. I'm using my hands a lot here, and I know that uh, <laughs> that's not very helpful. If you think of a graph where you are plotting the data points with just little circles, we would want them on the same level of the graph. When we see the verbal skills on the cognitive be at the low end, or no, at the high end, and let's say in the reading comprehension and reading decoding skills on the low end, those are not linear. Those are a diagonal. The line is a diagonal. And that diagonal represents some type of interference that is likely a problem. It's not the only method to interpret results, but it definitely, for me, the issue is and why they have left kind of taking it off the table as a criteria is because of the unpredictable factors that could contribute to the person's test. This is just one example that could contribute to the person's approach to the test or, you know, explaining. It's not explanatory enough. Right. 
in in the school's mind. So, but it certainly makes a lot of sense when it is explanatory uh, that it fits why it's a red would... flag, right? Like, I mean, I agree with you. I also look at that and say there's something going on here that we need to reinvestigate. Like, maybe there is some unpredictable component, but you know, if you're telling me that this evaluation is an accurate representation of the child because they were compliant and because they gave it their all and all of this stuff. And then you're going to tell me that this is unpredictable. That doesn't fly with me either. And I think when you see those, that kind of scatter and those differences, sometimes I'll hear someone say, well, you know, the over the umbrella score is good. And the only reason this one's a little lower is because of the subtest. Well, that's what I want to look at. Why, why are they doing well? And for the subtest and one of them, they just bombed. I'm not looking at that like, oh, well, these other four skills are going to take over and make it better. Mm -hmm. I want to look at the skill that isn't working because it's clearly impacting something. And then also looking to your point at the cognitive component versus the achievement component, I think is a huge piece because if we have a child who is scoring, say, super high cognitively and they're average to low average achievement wise, that's telling me something too. Why is that? You know, why are they not performing at their ability level? Or the other way, I've also had, I did once have a case where the, the child's cognitive component was way lower than their achievement. And it was either something's going on with them taking the test or this kid is ridiculously motivated. You know, like I don't, that, I don't well, those know. Are the, right, those are the factors that you have to really take into consideration, like behavioral observations. That's the section of the report where the evaluator will describe how the child approached the test, whether well, ranging from how they held their pencil to whether they persisted when things got hard mm -hmm. uh, becomes so uh, just as important as the test scores. Right. But, well, and administering the test too, right? Because a lot of them, you can't explain things. You can't yep. reword the questions. So you have to, and and if you don't know, if if a teacher did reword the question or did give, you know what I'm saying? Like there's just, mm -hmm. there's some yep. level of consistency within the test administration too that needs to happen. And you know, sometimes I, I've had children say, well, they tested me in the library and the reading class was bothering me. Well, yep. that shouldn't have happened. Or I, oh my gosh, I was in a meeting once where they said, well, we administered it in a small group. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? And they said, well, they had so many kids they needed to test that they administered some of the subtests in small groups. And, and that just, that, I don't know, does that nullify the school or do, I don't know what it, it discounts it somehow. I was like, that's not how you're supposed to administer the test. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. a critical component as well. And admittedly, sometimes kids do do better one-on-one -on -one in a quiet environment, but that's what, that's what the test is for, right? You know, right. So are, what, what is the child's performance like when they're kind of an optimal environment for performance, right? You know, like quiet, no distractions, no confounding factors like, hey, he handed in his test first before me. What does that mean? Oh my gosh, am I not doing, am I going fast enough? To, like, right, all the, just even the distraction of like other kids in the room not being disruptive, but just what their approach to the test is um, or the task is, right? So that, and that, I mean, you're not giving a test like we do for an evaluation in a classroom setting, but there might be an element of, um, will they perform well or they perform they performed very well on my reading assessment, assessing their comprehension. But when they took the test last Friday in the classroom setting for ELA, they bombed it, right? And so like we have to take those factors into consideration too. Right. And so, I, yeah, I always focus on the administration too, because you never know. And sometimes they don't say anything, but if you ask like, how, what was the environment? What, who was around you? You know, what, why? Ask questions. That's what I always say to parents. If, if, if this doesn't look like your child, ask questions, you know, ask as many questions as you need. And I would really hone in on the, what was different? You're not being, it's not about the right approaching it, being curious. Right. There, there, there always is going to be a difference in, and I don't mean for like, it's like to come together, right? To think about why, what other factors may have been present that weren't kind of like you couldn't control for. Um, like, oh, well, the WISP test that I gave requires the child to think off the top of their head, whereas that same skill was measured in class, but they had paper and pencil kind of to do it, which is a very different, it's not about how much, so their, their vocabulary is being assessed. Well, they did great on the vocab and definition test we did in class on Friday. They did terrible on the vocab test in my office. 
Well, that's because my vocab test requires them to just define words off the top of their head. Your test had a visual component that may have prompted them, which is good information. Why? So that's like, can't get to get a step further. Again, being curious. Well, what does that mean? What is that? That was a difference in the format. Or were they aware of the words in advance? Was it something they were seeing? Yeah, absolutely. That would make a difference too. What are the areas that you see that you most often say, you know, we need to do additional testing? And like, I'm going to guess that executive functioning comes up a lot. I'm just throwing that out a lot. But what are some areas where you would look at and be like, this kid needs additional we need more information that maybe either you have to do more testing or you have to say they need to go somewhere else for more testing because like, does that happen a lot? Yes, I think that in the area of attention and executive functioning and then social emotional functioning. So that it's unfortunately the case that sometimes things are couched in, we'll just say in ADHD. So in a child where there's suspected attentional issues, the message that I do hear from parents that's sent to them often at times at the school level when it as it relates to testing is go treat it yourself. This is more of an outside issue. We know that there is some attentional issues present, but that's probably because they have ADHD. So, right, like the idea is like that the diagnosis is explanatory and it's not it's just a category we've kind of used to help communicate with each other about what the child's struggling with what about their attention is disruptive or interfering and even if it's not a disruption to the teacher or the classroom if the child's not performing to their potential it could be a factor involved within themselves, right? That we have right, to like the, that the school needs piece. to understand more to really help right. them. So like the inattentive piece versus the physical acting out kind of thing. Right, right. So that, but also like executive to tie in executive function. So attention attention problems and executive functioning problems go go hand in hand and involve more than just daydreaming or like in, in the inattention kind mm-hmm. of realm. Extended time on tests is the kind of go-to recommendation as though it's like a just a fix-it strategy for all the problems that a child with ADHD suffers from and struggles with. Uh, So we don't do two things. We need to both like qualitatively look at it. Like what are parents, the rating scales that everyone completes, the parents, the teachers, sometimes the student, those are kind of checklists for what symptoms you observe or do you experience? And that's really helpful. But we also need to get actual numbers attached to those skills because they are brain-based. They're not just out in the world, right? How and in behavior and how they operate. They're they're affected by problems in certain areas of brain functioning. The executive functions are in the frontal lobe, right? So we want to also get like a direct measure. And that's this is where I do think uh, an area that fall the schools fall short. There's not a lot of direct measuring of the attention skills. And that's important if we're actually going to plan for the child, because to say, oh, they just have ADHD, (laughs) who has just ADHD, right? It's a different (laughs) in the way they learn in our public school system, at least in this part of the country, is not geared towards a learning style that gets off task, that doesn't involve, uh, that involves um, sitting, Yes. And working. I remember my own kids coming home from first grade. First grade, oh my gosh, the transition from kindergarten to first grade um, simply uh, being, all we do is, uh, we do packets. All oh, we do is packets. Oh my and gosh, I'll my- never forget. It was so representative. And that was the year that they learned what that school is. And you know, there's a level of like acceptance. Like this is for, for them. This is what they they have to uh, adapt to, right? Because that's the school they're going to. For now, um, it really was like a eye-opening in terms of how demanding school is for kids at an earlier and earlier age every year. And that that demandingness isn't a one-size-fits-all kind of method. It is something that works for some kids and more, doesn't work for a whole lot of kids. Well, I think we learned during the pandemic that however children are learning is not promoting independent work. Because anyone else in the world who had kids come home and work from home, whatever we called it, I know mine were not independent. 
And I had a variety of ages. I got five kids. So I got a bunch of ages in my house during the pandemic. And, you know, no one was independent. That that was a huge component of it. So I don't know what was keeping them, you know, in the in the public schools and in, in that zone, but coming home, it was a whole different ballgame. So, mm-hmm. you know, that can definitely impact it as well. And isn't ADHD, doesn't that impact some of these tests and their scores? If a child does have ADHD, doesn't, don't you expect that some of these scores will be a little bit skewed? Yes. So we, we there's, there are ADHD profiles. So things that from the research, we know kids with ADHD tend to do uh, have weaker skills in or do poor in processing speed and working memory are the two kind of most common ones. So when we talked about that scatter plot before, uh, someone with ADHD might have average to high average problem sol- verbal, nonverbal problem solving skills, visual spatial skills, vocab skills, whatnot. But when they're working memory and their processing speed are assessed, those tend to be lower. So we have a scatter there. It supports, it doesn't tell us the child has ADHD, but if we have a suspicion that it's present, that would be an example of a a way we're measuring it directly. With that said, I've had plenty of children who have eventually, will have like eventually come to have an ADHD diagnosis that score in the superior range on every single cognitive test I give them. And and that goes back to unpacking and understanding what's under the umbrella. What makes up attentional problems that is specific to this child? Because for the tests that we give, whether it's a school or my setting, they're all more or less the same. They're tests that are of short duration. And even if they're a little bit longer, they're not representative of like a class that runs for 90 minutes or a, a project that one has to work on um, that takes them in, you know, in class the full hour's time, right? They're, they're at most 13 minutes for a, a test that's looking at sustained attention and the child oh, wow. has a very boring task on the computer for 13 minutes straight. I can't, if I did that for all the tests, like we wouldn't have, kids would not be able to come in and just like the natural kind of boringness of that one-on-one would, would confound the data. So that's one piece is that the child that might be able to negotiate the test in our office because they don't have a problem with selective attention, like honing in on and narrowing in on the tasks that they need to do, getting it over with and moving on. They might struggle with persisting as task demands increase or sustaining their attention for a long period of time, right? So that persistence and attentional stamina, they're tank might empty quickly. And we don't really know that from a four to five minute test, which is usually like the average of what they are. Right. So we have to look beyond that. Great. I think we've covered just about everything on these evaluations. I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to incorporate. I did want to ask you my last question, which is when a parent is looking for an evaluator, when they are going out to find somebody and they get a million names from different people and they say, well, this person was great for us or this person was great for somebody else, what should the, what questions should they be asking an evaluator if they're going to get an educational assessment of their child, whether they are paying for it or somebody else, it doesn't matter. What sort of questions should they be asking the evaluator to make sure they're getting the recommendations that they're looking for? Mm-hmm. I would be asking if I had to choose one, because I think that you can, you know, on paper, right? Every the, Usually most people who do evaluations in this nature are trained and well-versed in doing them. So I wouldn't, re- I wouldn't gravitate towards asking like what types of tests they do or how long it will take for them to do it. Unless, of course, it's time sensitive and then that becomes an issue. What I would be focusing more on is how do they interpret the result? What's your style for interpreting the scores. And the key word you want to listen for is integrative. I integrate the result. School testing, and this is not a knock on school. This is their approach based on what the training model dictates. They do report the scores as is with little to no integration. Time and place for that, which is usually an outside eval. For my training as a clinical psychologist with a specialization in assessment, the uh, bulk of the extra coursework was in writing the results in a way where we, well, we need, well I mean, my integrative is how does one affect the other? Mm-hmm. So how does 
my child's moderate level of anxiety that came up on the desk three that the teachers and the parents filled out um, on their behalf, how does that then interfere with their uh, attention level? So like we all can think of when we're anxious, we have thoughts that distract us. So if I'm already distracted based on an organic issue, the ADHD, and I'm also now anxious because I see everyone in my class finishing first, or I don't know how to approach this because I don't have those executive functions to break things down into smaller steps, or it doesn't come naturally to me. How does that then cause a perfect storm where I now have a failing grade in reading? Mm. Because I couldn't master the task. It's not that I have dyslexia or reading disability. It's not just because I have ADHD. It is often like the combination kind of of all of these factors that then leads to a big problem, right? And so if we don't look at those transactions and the way they interact, we are usually only treating one part of the problem. That's a great explanation. I love that. Integrative. Um, as a lawyer, I have different questions. <laughs> My <laughs> questions are usually, will you present this at the PPT or the IEP meeting or... Is that separate or a separate cost? Because I'm aware that sometimes, you know, when either parents pay for it or school districts, if it comes time for the meeting and the evaluator is nowhere to be seen or they won't do that, I also ask, would you testify to this in a hearing? Would you testify to your to your results in a hearing? Because I know that there are some people who won't do that. They don't want to get involved in the dispute. And knowing that mm -hmm. up front would be really important, even if you don't anticipate a dispute. I find that if somebody's unwilling to get involved in one, they may not be willing to write strong recommendations too. So you never mm -hmm. know where you're going to go. So those are kind of my main questions, but I think yours is better. <laughs> Substantive. But thank you. This has been really great. I know this is a ton of information in one small place. So um, if somebody's listening to this and they're like, oh my God, I've got to get Dr. Nadeo to evaluate my child. How can they find you? How can they reach you? So our website, uh, newtowncap.com has contact information to get in touch with our office manager who can start the process of setting up a parent consult where I meet with the parent or parents to get a lay of the land and figure out uh, what what's needed, what's wanted, what kind of the best practice would be based on kind of like understanding the, the bigger picture, I'm sorry, the full story. Um, so consults is the parent consult will be the first step. And from there, we discuss the different options for testing. Great. And, uh, what's, what's next? Excellent. Well, I will have that in the show notes. So if anyone's listening to this and they are driving and not sure where to look, uh, definitely go back and look at the show notes. And um, thank you so much, for, Diana, for thank joining. You for having me really helpful. And I know this is going to be really helpful for parents. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me today. Please don't forget to follow this podcast so you don't miss any new episodes and leave a review when you have a chance. If there's anything you want to hear about or comment on, please go to my Facebook page, Special Ed on Special Ed and find me there. I'll see you next time here on Special Ed on Special Ed. Have a fabulous day. The views expressed in this episode are those of the speakers at the time of the recording and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company, or even that individual today. 